continuation. I thank the House. I congratulate the member for Fisher for his preliminary valedictory and wish him well. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 43. The Prime Minister has the call. Was the Prime Minister going to make any announcements in respect of ministerial arrangements? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, um, um, Speaker. Uh, for the purposes of question time today, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, will answer questions uh, which are relevant to the portfolio of um, uh, will answer questions relevant to the portfolio of trade. He will answer questions relevant to the portfolio uh, of uh, broadband, as he normally does. Are there any questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Yes, my question, Madam Speaker, is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister explain to this House why the events of last night were necessary, and will he end the uncertainty that they have created by confirming the date for the election? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. Uh, let me go to uh, the second part of his question uh, first, which deal with the timing of the election. Uh, as the honourable gentleman knows, the timing of the election is governed by the Australian Constitution, and it's work ha worth having a look at that document, as it is the law which governs all Australians. Secondly, I would simply draw the Leader of the Opposition's attention to the fact the, uh, draw the Leader of the Opposition's attention to the fact that the practice of uh, Prime Minister Keating, Prime Minister Hawke, Prime Minister Howard, Prime Minister Menzies was in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution to identify a date for an election. Uh, I will be no different to any of my predecessors. Now, the Leader of the Opposition again goes to questions of timing. I would draw his attention to facts which are material to the considerations of the government. Number one is the, number one is the timing of the G20 summit in St Petersburg, scheduled for the 6th and 7th of September. Uh, number two uh, is, of course, the timing of the local government, uh, local government referendum. And the third uh, to the Leader of the Opposition is, of course, uh, the current coincidence of the election date with Yom Kippur. I will therefore go through these issues. I will therefore go through these issues with my cabinet colleagues, and the Leader of the Opposition can rest assured there's going to be an election. It will be held consistent with the Constitution, and if he's looked at the dates, there's not going to be a huge variation one way or the other. And it is for the Australian people to decide, and I look forward to contesting him in these elections on our alternative plans for Australia's the future. Positive plans, not slogans. The member for Patterson. The Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. Yes, uh, to the Prime Minister. Order! Order! The Leader of the Opposition has the call. The Parliamentary Secretary does not. My friend from Tasmania. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Yes. Why should the Australian people accept that their right to choose their Prime Minister has been usurped by faceless men for the second time in just three years. The Prime Minister has the call. Can I, uh, I thank the honourable member for his question, Leader of the Opposition. In the four years that I was Leader of the Australian Labor Party, I faced leaders John Howard, I faced Brendan Nelson, I faced also someone by the name of Malcolm Turnbull, and latterly, most recently, as the honourable member for Wentworth will recall, Tony Abbott. I had four leaders in four years. These are matters for internal to party deliberations in his party and in ours. Let's get on to questions about the country's future. Order! The member for La Trobe has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, why is the government optimistic about the future of our economy and what that means for all Australians? The Prime Minister. Has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. Uh, we in this country, if you were to uh, step anywhere else into the world today, they would look at Australia and say, "This is one of the best performing economies in the world." Yeah. And if you stand, however, in this chamber, it is like we have entered an altered universe. 
And the altered universe suggested by the negative politics of those opposite is that this economy is somehow on its knees, which it is not. The basic economic data stands Australia proud. It is that not only have we come through the worst economic crisis since the Depression without going into recession, without bringing on mass unemployment, we've done, th done so with low inflation levels, low interest rates for Australian working families, and on top of that, a, an avoidance of mass unemployment and employment levels which are the envy of the world. That is why this government and the nation at large should be confident. Can I say also that when it comes to detracting from national economic confidence, it is important that all of us engage in a positive economic debate. And having observed um, from uh, the nether regions for the last few years uh, what has actually gone on in this debate, it gives you a bit of perspective. And let I say that during that period of time, what I have seen is every single piece of good economic data advanced about the Australian economy, those opposite will seek to either ignore it, belittle it or to distort it. That's simply how it's gone. I believe that what the Australian people are looking for is a positive vision for the nation's future. What they want is Member positive politics, is not warned. negative politics. They want us to build the house up, not tear it down. They want a government which says, here are the problems we face, face them squarely on the, face, on the basis of facts, on the basis of real argument, on the basis of practical policy solutions. And I could say to the Leader of the Opposition, if the Australian people vote him in as the next Prime Minister of Australia, if they do, there is one core economic challenge facing us all, and that is this. The China resources boom is over, and the China trade itself represents such a huge slice of the Australian national economy that we are looking at one huge adjustment for this nation's standards of living in the future unless we continue to act with appropriate policy responses. That means on productivity we need to work hard to continue to boost our productivity. It means also the diversification, diversification of our economy. It means building up our manufacturing again. It means building up also our agricultural sector and our processed food sector. This is the way forward. This is the way forward given the challenges we now face with a changed set of global economic circumstances. This government will put forward positive solutions as to how we handle those challenges as we've done in the past. It's time for the old politics of negativity to just be dead and buried. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his statement in the House today about the member for Lawler and also to his promise to her that, and I quote, I will not under any circumstances mount a challenge against your leadership. I go one step further. If anyone turns on Julia in the 18 months ahead, you, Julia, will find me in your corner against them. <laughs> if the member for Lawler couldn't trust the Prime Minister, why should the Australian people believe any promise he makes between now and the election? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question. If the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was observing the political debate in this place yesterday, she would have heard in my statement uh, to uh, the press gallery prior to the ballot which was held at 7 p.m. yesterday my reasons for a change in position which I outlined clearly the and own responsibility for it. I would draw also the attention of the House to the multiple statements made by the then member for Warringah. Uh, concerning the member for Wentworth when he was Leader of the Opposition. I think it's not a time for pots calling kettles black. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Honour, the member for North Sydney is, de is denying the Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. To the Prime Minister. In his Order! Order! The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. The Prime Minister has just indicated he answered the question yesterday, but I remind him that this year he said, and I quote, when I say to the people across Australia that I would not challenge for the leadership, I believe in honouring my word. Others treat such commitments lightly. I do not. Why didn't the Prime Minister keep his word to the member for Lawler? time has expired. The Prime Minister has the call. I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question, and I refer her again to my statement yesterday. I have nothing further to add. Yeah. The member for Page. Thank Order. you. The member for Page has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure. Minister, how is the government investing in the infrastructure to build a stronger economy and a better future for our nation? Good question. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. 
I thank the member for Page for her question, where earlier this month we announced pre-construction funding to get the Woolgoolga to Ballina section of the Pacific Highway shovel ready. It goes along with the work that is taking place right up and down the north coast of New South Wales. And I'm proud today that uh, I've announced, prior to question time, the opening of the Bulladeela Bypass, just in time for the school holidays. We on this side of the House understand the importance of nation-building infrastructure for boosting productivity, for reducing travel times, but importantly also for road safety. And I'm reminded, I'm reminded of uh, a, a particular day that I had uh, with the Prime Minister and the then Treasurer on the Karoi de Curra section of the highway, the Bruce Highway in Queensland. There I had a delegation uh, just prior to uh, the budget when we were dealing with the global financial crisis here in Parliament House. And I met uh, a gentleman by the name of Wayne Sachs. Wayne Sachs is Wayne. the chief AMBO uh, in Gympie. And what Wayne Sachs did was go through, in a very human way, the reality of what it is like to be an ambulance driver, whether it be in the area around the Bruce Highway or the Pacific Highway or the Midland Highway in Tasmania or any of our ma other major roads, where they have to see more tragedies in life than most of us. So that is why I'm very proud of our investment in the Pacific Highway, of our investment in the Bruce Highway, and I was proud, proud to be with uh, the, uh, the then Prime Minister uh, on the weekend at the Hume Highway opening, at the Hume Highway opening, completing the duplication of the Hume Highway. We have nation-building infrastructure projects right around the nation. $60 billion in the nation building program, but of course, as well, we have the national broadband network. Overcoming the tyranny of distance from which Australia has had a disadvantage, a disadvantage on whether it be across our vast land or whether it be competing with our international neighbours. The fact is that this is a government that has a plan for nation building. We have a plan for infrastructure. That is why we have put in place the Infrastructure Australia process so we get proper advice, something that those on the opposite side of the House seem to have forgotten even exists. And that is why we are investing not just in nation-building road projects but also, importantly, in urban rail projects and in freight rail. The member for Sturt has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I remind the Prime Minister that already the former Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer, Senate Leader and Minister for Communications, and the Ministers for Schools and Climate Change, Trade and Agriculture have refused to serve in his government. If a third of the Cabinet doesn't trust the Prime Minister, why should the Australian people? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I thank uh, the honourable member for his question. As I said yesterday, I honour the contributions which my ministerial colleagues have delivered to Australia, and they have been strong contributions. And in this place, we all make decisions about whether we wish to continue in political Order. or ministerial life or not. These are personal decisions, and those on the other side of politics, those on the other side of politics, will fully recall their own experiences in their own political careers over time. What I am concerned about in this place, uh, Speaker, is whether we are going to degenerate into the old politics of negativity with every question raised by those opposites, or whether we have some chance of the politics of hope. The Prime Minister has concluded his answer. The member for Lyon. Order! The member for Lyon has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in agreements reached at the start of the 43rd Parliament, Regional Australia made its way onto the map, with $9.9 billion for Regional Australia, $1.8 billion for the Regional Health and Hospital Fund uh, and $500 million for a regional round of an education infrastructure fund. For the 44th Parliament, as we go from the period of governing to electioneering, will you commit to matching that for Regional Australia or even beating it? The member for Indi does not have the call. The Prime Minister does. Can I thank uh, the honourable member for his question? 
and uh, I would apologise to him for not, being, not having been present for his valedictory speech. He has served his constituents well in this place. He has delivered to his constituents that which he committed to them locally. Uh, his schools, uh, his health services, and I recall well with the Deputy Prime Minister attending various um, uh, ceremonies in the electorate concerned with the Pacific Highway. And when you look at the plan which the government has in place the for, for the completion of the dual carriageway of the Pacific Highway, one thing that we will be able to look back with pride as a government and a parliament, and with you as the local member, is the number of lives that will be saved as a result of that necessary work on the Pacific Highway. That is bread and butter stuff for people who travel from Sydney up to Brisbane along the Pacific. The honourable member asked me to give a forward commitment for the next parliament in terms of particular allocations, and I think the quantity of them. Can I just say, the honourable member, I'm not into that business. Can I say, however, that regional Australia is etched deep into my heart. I grew up in a region. I grew up in a country town. I understand what it was like not to have a local doctor. I understand what it was like not to have a local dentist. I understand from my experience Order. as a kid growing up what it's not to have secure housing either. And can I say, therefore, to the honourable member, I am acutely conscious of those needs. And that is why I would say, in response to the honourable member's question, regional Australia is writ large not just in my own heart but in the heart of this entire government. And that is because working people live right across Australia, not just in big cities, not just in regional cities, but in small towns as well. They deserve the same infrastructure as the city folks get, and that is why, in part, we are delivering the national broadband network across regional Australia. No discriminatory rules, no leaving the bush out, no leaving regional Australia out, and the honourable member's constituents will be well served by that innovation as well. In conclusion, I thank the honourable member for his great service to the parliament. I wish he and his family all the very best for the future. Yeah. The member for Robertson has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the state of the economy? How is the government supporting the big transitions that are underway? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member for Robertson for her question. She's a very good local member, including to my mum and dad, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, our economy is strong and stable, and Australians have every reason to be very confident in our economic future. We have solid economic growth. And since Labor came to power, the Australian economy has grown by 14%. And our economy has outperformed other, every other major advanced economy over this period. We've grown twice as fast as Canada, four times faster than the United States, and nearly six times faster than Germany. And we've created jobs, and we have low unemployment. We've created more than 950,000 jobs. That compares to 4.8 million jobs lost in the European Union and 2.4 million jobs lost in the United States over exactly the same period. And of course, since Labor came to office, Australia has recorded faster jobs growth than every other major economy, and we've delivered jobs growth at twice the rate of Canada and Germany and seven times the rate of the United Kingdom. And our, and our debt is very low in international terms as well. But of course, we do need to recognise that Australia's economy is in transition. We're moving from the investment phase to the production phase in the mining industry, and this does have a very big impact on our economy. And of course, this is set against the continued growth of China. Now, of course, we see discussions and debates about Chinese economic growth and what rates it will continue at. But we know this. The Chinese economy is 50 per cent larger than it was just five years ago. So even lower economic growth in China will continue to have a strong impact on the Australian economy. And of course, uh, Madam Speaker, we do need to work with industry and with unions across the board to make sure that we are managing that transition. Uh, this morning I've spoken to Tony Shepherd uh, of the Business Council of Australia, to Peter Anderson of Aki, to Ennis Willocks of uh, AIG and to Peter Strong of COSBOA and indicated that the government will be working very closely with them as we move towards the transition phase of the economy. We will continue to put in place the major economic reforms, like the NBN, like infrastructure and like carbon pricing, and we will continue to leave our doors open to business to make sure that we work together cooperatively as we manage this transition. The member for Sturt has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
I remind the Prime Minister that the Australian people voted for his election in 2007 and ended up with the member for Lawler. They voted for the member for Lawler in 2010 and ended up with him. What guarantee can he provide that if the Australian people re-elect a Labor government in 2013, they won't end up with someone else after the election? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. This is either the fourth or fifth question in Same question policy. time, and not a single question on policy. Here, here. And when I say to those opposite, once again we see on parade the old politics whereby we scream at each other, uh, we uh, don't work with each other, we try and scare people rather than make them think, and then Order. on top of that we engage in politics which divides ordinary Australians rather than unites them. The honourable member, the honourable member, will be full aware, fully aware that the nation faces large challenges for the future. I find it remarkable that the honourable member should be so nervous about the leader of the opposition's prospects for the next election. The member, and I'm growing a bit tired of the member for Dixon's constant interjections. The member for Karangamite has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families community services, indigenous affairs and disability reform. How is the government building a better future for people with a disability, with their families, carers, particularly of course with the launch of Disability Care Australia next week? The Minister for Families, Communities, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform has the call. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I do thank the member for Karangamite very much for that question and thank him and the member for Corio for all the work they have done supporting the launch of Disability Care Australia in uh, Geelong. Uh, I, I do have to say to the member for Karangamite and the member for Corio, as I've said many times, uh, they have been fierce in their um, campaigning to get the headquarters for Disability Care Australia in Geelong, and they have succeeded. Uh, it is a very exciting time uh, for people with disability and their families and carers as we see the start of disability care in uh, Geelong, in the Barwon region, in the Hunter and, of course, for little children in South Australia and for young people in Tasmania from Monday. A very, very exciting time for people with disability. It is, uh, of course, as part of the launch, we'll see around 26,000 people with disability get the care and support that they need, get the care and support that they have never had before. People, of course, will also be able to have choice and control over the care and support that they receive and for the first time will be part of developing their own personal care support plans. No longer will we see uh, people with disability uh, in these launch site areas having to wait sometimes years and years for a new wheelchair or wait at the end of a phone for a place in respite, uh, which of course has such a big impact on the lives of families and of carers. What we want to do is make sure that this uh, time of waiting is over. Of course, there's a lot happening in the launch sites. Uh, people with disability are already uh, ringing up, making their appointments for next week. Providers uh, of services Member to people Bradfield with uh, disability talk. are, of course, uh, making sure that they're registered. Uh, we've already had a lot of people go online with My Access Checker to see whether or not they would be eligible. I do want to uh, particularly acknowledge the enormous campaign that's been run by so many people with disability and advocates over a very, very long period of time. The celebration that we will start with on Monday is a celebration of their advocacy that will change the lives of people with disability and their carers forever. Just before I call the Leader of the Opposition, I welcome onto the floor of the chamber this afternoon the ambassador from Chile, His Excellency Pedro Pablo Diaz. We welcome him to the House this afternoon. Hear, hear. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. I remind him of his promises to take, and I quote, a very hard line on people smuggling, to fix public hospitals or take them over, to run surpluses over the economic cycle and to reduce the cost of living through Fuel Watch and Grocery Watch. 
all of which promises he subsequently broke or dumped. As he was all talk and no action then, why should the Australian people believe that anything has changed? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I uh, thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. And, uh, in his listing of uh, the litany, uh, he, uh, skipped, he skipped happily over a number of facts, including the state of our public hospital system and the uh, funding proposals which we have put forward to do that. I would remind the Leader of the Opposition that he uh, went on the public record some years ago uh, to say that he believed the perfect public policy response on his part was to take over the national hospital system of Australia from the states. Uh, what I instead proposed as Prime Minister, and which uh, Prime Minister Gillard subsequently followed up on, was an arrangement with the states whereby we would provide 60% uh, of funding for the funding of the public hospital system in order to provide durable public funding from the Commonwealth into the future. Member for the, uh, uh, my successor as Prime Minister then undertook a further negotiation with the states, which landed that at 50%. Can I say to the Leader of the Opposition a very simple thing? And that is, under his period as health minister, we saw the level of federal contribution to the public hospital system go down and down and down and down. And therefore, when the states Order. around Australia said that there was a problem with the hospital system, uh, it was necessary the for the minister, Commonwealth to step in, the and Prime we did. The Prime Minister will resume his seat before the manager of opposition business begins his point of order. I will again remind him of abuses of points of order. The manager of opposition Perfectly business Perfectly fair enough, Madam Speaker. My point of order is simply that how can he be relevant to the question when he is repeating a falsehood which has been the cleared up in this House of opposition time business and time again by the Leader of the, the Opposition? The Chamber under 94A. The manager of opposition business. The manager of opposition business knows full well he cannot use points of order for debate. The Prime Minister has the call. The Manager of Opposition Business will leave the chamber under 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. And so, uh, Speaker, I would simply say this. Under the Leader of the Opposition, when he was Minister for Health, the relative real contribution by the Commonwealth to the public hospital system of Australia went down and down and down. That is a statistical fact. Uh, which, um, once again, if the Leader of the Opposition is happy to do so, I would be happy to debate with him one day at the National Health Club, a National Press Club, and that is uh, what is the relative funding and contributions by us as opposed to them for the public health of the Commonwealth. I would welcome a debate on public policy, welcome a debate on the future of the health system, welcome a debate on the future of the education system, welcome a debate on the future of the economy and on broadband. I'd welcome a debate on national security, but all we get here is politics, 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 the old politics of simply negative interjections and invective as opposed to building a constructive argument for one vision for Australia's future versus anything else he may choose to offer. We're on the side of a positive plan for Australia's future. I wish he would join the bus. The member for Canberra has the call. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Defence. Minister, how is the government strengthening its defence ties in North Asia? And will the Minister update the House on the increasing strategic importance to Australia of North Asia? The Minister for Defence has the call. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member for her question and for her long-standing interest in national security matters. North Asia is, of course, extremely important to Australia. Uh, some of our largest trading partners are there—China, Japan, the Republic of Korea. We also have some of our most important bilateral military-to-military -military and defence-to-defence relationships there, and we have grown these relationships uh, in recent years. But with China, for example, we are one of a very small number of countries who, for the last 15 years, has had with China a strategic dialogue at the level of Chief of the Defence Force and Secretary of the Defence Department. In the last two years, we have engaged uh, for the first time on mainland China with exercises with uh, the PLA. We've also uh, exchanged uh, Navy ship visits and engaged in live firing exercises. Uh, this is, of course, deeply important and is consistent uh, with uh, the strategic analysis that you find in the 2013 White Paper that stability and security uh, in North Asia uh, is equally important for, for prosperity. Uh, when it comes to Japan, J Japan 
Uh, with Japan, we have, uh, over the last decade, substantially enhanced the defence-to-defence -defense relationship and the strategic relationship that we have uh, with Japan. We now do with Japan, for example, a two plus two meeting in defence and foreign ministers format. We also engage now at ministerial level with Japan at the trilateral, le trilateral level, Australia, uh, Japan and the United States at both foreign ministerial and defence ministerial level. I conducted the second defence ministerial uh, trilateral discussions in Shangri -La, uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore uh, recently. Uh, and uh, I'll be visiting Japan next week uh, for what will be my eighth or ninth visit to Japan uh, as a government minister, either foreign or defence, reflecting the strategic importance of our relationship uh, with Japan. So far as Korea is concerned, we have substantially grown our defence to defence and uh, military to military engagement with, uh, with uh, the Republic of Korea. We have stood shoulder to shoulder with the Republic of Korea in the face of provocation from North Korea, the DPRK. Uh, and next week, uh, the Foreign Minister, Senator Carr, and I will conduct uh, in Seoul for the first occasion a two plus two, a Foreign Minister and Defence Minister strategic uh, uh, meeting putting our relationship in terms of architecture uh, with, uh, with the Republic of Korea on the same uh, national security and strategic uh, architecture relationship in terms of the two plus two uh, with uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Indonesia uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one other that currently escapes me. I'm sure it will come back to me. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but the two plus two with Korea uh, will be an important addition uh, to the discussions that we have, consolidating and underpinning the importance of North Asia to our uh, economic circumstances, our prosperity, but also to our strategic circumstances. The member for North Sydney has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister stand by the spending commitments and saving measures in the 2013 Labor government budget delivered just six weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. I thank, uh, I thank uh, the member for North Sydney for. The Minister uh, is warned. I thank the member for North Sydney for his question, and uh, I know his uh, deep concern for the state of our economy. Uh, we have discussed this many times, privately and publicly, over a long period of time. Can I say to uh, the member for North Sydney, uh, I will be discussing uh, the general state of the budget and the state of the economy, including new international the challenges such as the China resources warned. boom uh, finish. Uh, when uh, the new cabinet meets, I assume that will be early next week. Over the course of the weekend, I intend to obtain Treasury briefings to update myself on the current budgetary circumstances. That is the proper and, me and methodical way to go through important considerations, and that's what I intend to do. I would say also to the member for North Sydney uh, that I would remind him again of how, how strong our country's economic fundamentals are. Th therefore, therefore, when the, those opposite, as I've observed again from a distant place over the last uh, several years, engage in a constant attack on the levels of debt and the levels of budget deficit in this country, uh, frankly, uh, they've never asked, answered this very simple question. If it was so bad, why do the world's three major credit rating agencies give Australia a triple A rating? So, Member for North Sydney, answer, answer that one for me. It's uh, all three. All three global ratings agencies, Fitch, Standard & Poor's and Moody's, which are the not sub-branches of the Australian the Labor Party, on a for a last tour, uh, which do not work for the cause of international socialism, uh, these institutions separately have looked at our level of government debt, our level of budget deficit, and have judged it to be one of only eight countries in the world worthy of a AAA credit rating. So again I say to the member for North Sydney, as he seeks to drill in on questions of the budget and budget integrity. Uh, how does he answer that proposition? I put it to him once in a television debate, and all I heard was a bit of spluttering at the other end. It's still we haven't had an answer to that simple proposition because it's not us saying it, it's the international credit agencies saying it. And the reason for it is that it is true. The finances of this country are in first class working order, and he knows it. The member for Deakin has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Financial Services and Superannuation. Minister, how are the government? Order. The member for Deakin will resume his seat. The member for Herbert will leave the chamber under 94A. 
The member for Deakin will commence his answer, his question again. The member for Deakin has the call. Thank you again, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Financial Services and Superannuation. Minister, how are the government's policies protecting and growing the retirement savings of hard-working Australians? The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations has the call. Order! I thank the member for Deakin for his question. Order! He and the whole of the Labor Party are interested in superannuation. Superannuation is a great Australian achievement, and it's one that this side of politics can take some justifiable pride in. If the Labor movement and the Labor Party had never championed universal compulsory superannuation, we just wouldn't have superannuation in this country. Superannuation delivers on the national pool of savings. Superannuation has delivered jobs in this country. Compulsory universal superannuation means that millions of Australians can look towards older age with the greater prospect of a decent retirement. And indeed, superannuation, the great Labor idea, championed by Labor members of parliament, championed by the trade union movement, what it has done has meant that many Australians can work hard and have the prospect of a peaceful and dignified retirement. I can report. I can report that the national pool of savings in this country now is $1.6 trillion. That makes us the envy of many other countries. And on the 1st of July this year, after 12 and 13 years of delay, for the first time ever, superannuation is going to go up again, and 8.5 million Australians will be the beneficiaries of this government's work. I can also say that on the 1st of July, that the concessional caps for people over 60 will increase. So people who are over 60 who have the opportunity to put a bit more into their super will be able to do so. I can also report that after the 1st of July, three and a half million Australians who earn less than $37,000 will be getting rebates into their superannuation because it's the Labor government who abolished the 15 per cent tax on superannuation contributions. So there is a lot of good things about superannuation, and there's a lot to be pleased about. But it's because we have a Labor government with a plan and a vision for superannuation. The electorate know at the next election that there is one party who supports universal compulsory superannuation. There is one party in Australia who supports increasing superannuation so the many can have a proper retirement. There is one party in Australia who supports the idea that low-paid workers should not have to pay a 15 per cent tax on their superannuation contributions. And lest anyone be confused about which party of Australian politics stands for universal compulsory superannuation, it is the Labor Party. The member for Kuyong is warned. The member for North Sydney has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. Given that the Australian people never had an opportunity to vote on the introduction of the carbon tax, will he commit to scrapping the carbon tax, including the planned 5 per cent increase of the carbon tax on Monday, which he voted to reaffirm only yesterday? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, I would say to the uh, honourable member, and thank you for his question concerning carbon pricing, now, the carbon pricing has been a policy of this government since I went to the election uh, prior Order. to 2007. It was also, I seem to remember, the policy of those opposite. I, I, I might have had a little sort of uh, memory lapse there, but I seem to remember Mr Howard and various other ministers, including the member for Wentworth, standing up to defend uh, the importance of carbon pricing through an emissions trading scheme. Um, the uh, honourable members opposite will know I have long been committed to a carbon price. And, uh, and uh, I would say, ah, well, the leader of the opposition refers to his uh, twice, uh, twice uh, on two occasions, he, on behalf of the opposition, voting against an emissions trading scheme in this House, despite the fact that they went to the previous election with exactly such a policy. Now, uh, I would argue, in terms of some policy consistency, that those opposite have a little bit to explain on this question. Carbon pricing is now becoming more and more of a global reality. Um, uh, the um, uh, mention has been made in this place already of the uh, actions being taken in the People's Republic of China. Uh, and uh, this is important in terms of the debate traditionally raised by those opposite about global competitiveness. The member for Macon has the call. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Water. Will the Minister update the House on the progress of the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and how will this help build a brighter and more sustainable future for the basin? The Minister for Water has the call. Thanks very much. And I want to thank the member for, for Macon for the question. He's been a very strong advocate for the Murray River in particular and for the Murray-Darling Basin. This government's very proud to have been the government that finally developed a plan for the Murray-Darling Basin. Yeah. I remember at a community cabinet about five years ago the Prime Minister referring to the Murray as having been over-allocated to death, and yet we have a situation now where that same Murray-Darling Basin is being restored to health. I'm very pleased as well that the question comes from the, me the member for Macon, who played a significant role in the Windsor Committee, the Windsor Committee that was critical in making sure that we could get the support of this parliament on this issue. But it's also the case that there's two further pieces of information that I'm very pleased to report to the House on. Members will be aware that the final environmental outcomes we wanted to achieve were those commensurate with 3,200 gigalitres of water. I'm pleased to report we have now passed the halfway mark on held water. 1,638 gigalitres now held, now able to be used to restore a system to health, where irrigation is done to help the environment, not simply as a cost to the environment. It's also the case that we've had to make sure that we get the states working on the implementation part of the strategy. There are major projects to happen up and down the basin as part of the implementation to make sure that we can maximise the environmental outcomes in some ways to find ways of bridging the gap through methods other than buyback as well. I have reported previously to the House that Victoria, the ACT and our government obviously had signed up to the intergovernmental agreement. I am pleased to advise the House that shortly before question time I received a phone call from the Premier of South Australia and that South Australia is now also ready to sign on to the intergovernmental agreement. That means projects such as those for Chowler to make sure that new regulators are put in place, that when irrigation events for the environment happen there, the water is held on the floodplain for a longer period of time, restoring a broken system to health, turning the corner, turning the corner on what had been a century of degradation. This is one of the proud reforms of this parliament, of this government, something that's been worked on for a long time and something which the member for Macon and the other South Australian members in particular on this side and those across the parliament who worked on the Windsor Committee are able to say is an occasion where we have achieved something that had eluded our nation for a century. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Madam Speaker. And, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I remind him of his broken promise to turn boats around, his decision to abolish the Pacific Solution and temporary protection visas, his asylum, his asylum freeze that led to the riots and our detention centres, his decision to grant visas to those who blew up Civ 36 and his bungling of the Oceanic Viking incident. And I ask, will the Prime Minister finally accept responsibility for the decisions that have led to illegal boat arrivals now running at over 3,000 every month. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Uh, it's worth noting that in the period of the Howard government there are about 250 boats, I think, arrived uh, on Australia's shores, of which the Howard government turned back four to Indonesia. Four. Secondly, uh, on the, before honourable members get too excited about this, let me just be um, uh, quite direct about this matter. Prior to the 2007 election, uh, I indicated that uh, we would um, seek to turn, turn boats back. As the Leader of the Opposition will be advised, if he is elected and Prime Minister, the, as Prime Minister of Australia, uh, the officials and the security agencies and the Australian Navy will advise him that that is simply not possible under current circumstances. And the reason for that is because the Indonesian government has made it absolutely plain on the public record. Can I just quote the Indonesian ambassador, who I understand recently has been a dinner companion of the member for Curtin, uh, when the Indonesian ambassador came out and said, I think it's not possible for the coalition to say that it has to go back to Indonesia because Indonesia is not the origin country of these people. No such collaboration will happen between Indonesia and Australia to bring back the people to Indonesia. Now, Last time I looked at diplomatic practice, ambassadors speak on behalf of their country. That is what the Indonesian ambassador said not years ago. He said on the 31st of May 2013. And so I'd say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition, 
If we are having a serious debate in this country about asylum seekers, then it should be a debate about policies which work as opposed to slogans which sound good. And that is what is important here, because those opposite, those opposite know for a fact that the Indonesian ambassador and, th and through him the Indonesian government will not cooperate with the policy which he advocates. Of course, in the period ahead, I'll be taking briefings from the national Order. security uh, community about uh, what further can be done in this area. And I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition, and this is a genuine invitation to him, if you want to engage in a real policy discussion and provide real policy solutions which could work on the high seas to deal with this problem confronting not just Australia but countries around the world, I would urge him to take a briefing from the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, to take a briefing from ACES, to take a briefing from the Department of Immigration, the Department of Defence, the Australian Navy, the Department of Foreign Affairs. This is absolutely how proper policy making works. Facts are presented, alternative policies are produced, and then you get on with the business of implementing the policy. It's quite different to simply stand up and to use slogan and invective as if it's a, simply a substitute for policy. The easiest thing to do in this parliament is to stand up and to use invective. The hardest thing to do in this parliament is to put forward a policy plan which works for the nation. And there's still time for me to throw the member for Wallen out of the chamber. The member for Hindmarsh has the call. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Early Childhood and Child Care oh, and apologies. Employment My apologies. The member for Hindmarsh will resume his seat. I thought you were looking for a supplementary and you've used them up. The Leader of the Opposition. Ma Madam Speaker, would the Pri Prime Minister undertake to table the defence advice he referred to in his answer, claiming that the Navy can't the do now what they've the done before? The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Was the Prime Minister was the Prime Minister reading from a document? No, I wasn't, um, uh, Speaker, because I have been briefed on these things many times before. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, read the transcript of the advice from the Chief of Navy in Senate estimates, and on top of that, do what any other responsible alternative Prime Minister does and take briefings from the intelligence community, Prime from Minister, ASIS, from ASIO, Minister, from the Defence Department and from the services? The Prime Minister, or is he frightened of facing the, the facts? The Prime Minister will resume his seat. There was no document. There is nothing. The member for High Marsh has the call. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Early Childhood and Child Care and Employment Participation. How is the government investing in high-quality childcare and early childhood learning for families? The Minister for Early Childhood, Childcare and Employment Participation. Thank you very much, Speaker. And can I thank the member for Hindmarsh for his question? Um, members may be aware that earlier this week we saw a really appalling attack on our early childhood workforce when Conservative commentator Judith Sloan labelled our childcare workers as dimwits and that they came from second-rate universities in a blog and then defended those comments on national television. Now, I want to make very clear right here that we know that our workforce is made up of passionate, dedicated and qualified early childhood educators. They are early childhood educators to whom we owe much. We know that all of the research shows that these professionals are in fact shaping the lives of our children in their critical early years, and they must be recognised, they must be valued, and they must be rewarded for that hard work that they do. Now, earlier this week, this House voted on the question, do we support more early childhood professionals earning more in return for the hard work that they do? And I am incredibly proud that this side of the House voted a resounding yes to that question. Now, we know that there are already many educators who are earning above award rates through their centres enterprise agreements. And of course we support that. But what we want to do through this $300 million Early Years Quality Fund is ensure that we support more long day care services to be able to pay their staff more and to keep childcare affordable for the parents who are using that centre. Now, the, this obviously benefits the staff, but it also benefits those children, and it benefits the parents knowing that they are dropping their children off with staff members who they have ongoing relationships, trust and bonds with. And this is another part of the positive plan that we have for modern Australia. It builds on the very real reforms that we've made in this sector and across the childcare industry. 
We know that there are two camps when it comes to early childhood education and care. There are those who hold offensive, outdated views um, that, and, and label um, our workers as a babysitting service. The member for Goldstein. And there is Labor. Labor who has tripled funding to Very the sector. Labor who has increased affordability of childcare. Labor who has lifted the quality of care. And Labor who is making sure that more educators earn more money. We cannot risk turning back the clock on this sector. We are proud of the very real reforms that we've put in place for the benefits of children and for the benefits of parents right across Australia. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Yes, on indulgence, uh, Madam Speaker, could I just say that I support moves to improve the professionalism of our childcare sector. After all, after the Leader all, of the uh, Opposition will the resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The member for Flinders had order. The member for Flinders has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. I remind the Prime Minister that he was responsible for the home insulation program that cost a billion dollars to fix, was linked to four tragedies, more than 220 house fires, thousands of electrified roofs, and thousands of job losses, and that he personally received at Order. least 10 direct warnings. Will the Prime Minister apologise to Flinders all those will affected resume and his relief? Seat. The member for Flinders will resume his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Uh, yes, Speaker. More Order. Than... The member for Flinders. The Deputy Prime Minister has the Thank you, Speaker. More than a little bit of argument in that question. The, there were assertions and arguments put forward by the member. He should be asked to rephrase the question without the argument. The member for Flinders will restate the question without the argument. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I remind the Prime Minister that he was responsible for the home insulation program and that he personally received at least 10 direct warnings. Will the Prime Minister apologise to all those affected and release all letters of warning from then Minister Garrett? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, any industrial accident in Australia is one accident too many. Any industrial death in Australia is one death too many. And each year we have thousands of such deaths across Australia, and those four that the honourable member referred to uh, were a source of enormous grief to their families and enormous grief to their loved ones. Uh, as for the insulation program, uh, the honourable member will be familiar with the extensive debate which occurred in this uh, chamber in the previous the parliament. Prime Minister will resume. Seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister was asked to release all documents and correspondence uh, between the himself the and the former Minister, and he should respond seat. to that. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call and is being relevant to the question. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, I thank uh, again the um, honourable member for his question because it deals with industrial deaths industrial deaths which came directly out of an Australian government program. And there are industrial deaths which occur in this country regrettably every week. And those of us who are concerned about workers who die in their place of employment, and I know there are many members here who come from the trade union movement who have been engaged in this all their lives. Uh, I regret any industrial death which occurs in this country, including the four that you've just, you've just referred to. The member for Shortland has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the minister outline for the House how the government is building a strong and vibrant health system for the future? What milestones will be reached in the coming years to ensure better health outcomes for all Australians? The Minister for Health has the call. Thank you uh, for that question, and I want to thank the speaker. Um, we're building a health system for the future, and I'm proud of what we've achieved in the last few years. Uh, firstly, uh, of course, with Nicola Roxon, who did such a fine job with plain packaging and other aspects of the portfolio. Uh, and more recently, I've been proud of my own achievements. 
We're building a health system for the future. We're committed to delivering the best possible health care to patients at an affordable price. We're the party of Medicare. In fact, we love Medicare so much we had to introduce it twice because they killed That's it the true, first sure. time. Absolutely. We're the party That's of the true. pharmaceutical benefits scheme that delivers affordable medicines for Australians. And we've had added $5 billion worth of new medicines since 2007 to the PBS. We're the party that believes that universal health care is a basic right for all Australians. What does that mean for the future? Well, so far, Member since we Aspen. came to government in 2007, there are 11,000 more doctors in Australia. Not the shortages that we had when the Leader of the Opposition was the Health Minister, when he capped doctor training numbers. More hospital beds. Uh, 1,300 extra hospital beds we've promised. We're around 800 of those delivered so far. Less waiting. We've injected billions of dollars into rebuilding our hospitals, new emergency departments, uh, new beds for elective surgeries, and we're seeing the results of that now. And under health reform, we've guaranteed an extra $16.4 billion of funding between now and the end of the decade. And we've put billions of dollars, $3.4 billion, into rebuilding our public hospitals to uh, prepare them to move to activity-based funding. This huge reform that means hospitals will be um, funded more when they treat more patients. We're encouraging them to look after more people, do more elective surgery, deliver more babies, replace more hips. On 1 January, Grow Up Smiling will start $2.7 billion to ensure that for Australian children it will be as easy to go to the dentist as it now is to see a GP. Yeah. 3.4 million Australian children living in family tax benefit Part A families will find it as easy to go to the dentist as it now is to go to the GP. So they will grow up with better teeth. On 1 July, we're also providing the next lot of funding for public dental services, another $1.3 billion to build on the hundreds of millions that we've spent on reducing public dental waiting lists already. Um, we're going to, of course, continue to invest in improving bulk billing rates that hit historic lows under the Leader of the Opposition when he was the Health Minister. We've built Order. a stronger health system and will continue to build a stronger health system. Uh, because we believe that all Australians deserve a, a decent health system. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Speaker. The uh, stipulated number of questions have been asked. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Just before everybody leaves the chamber, I have a short state. I'm on my feet. I'd like to inform the House today that it's the last question time for Terry MacDonald from ABC's parliamentary broadcasting team. Most of us don't know Terry's face, just about all of us know Terry's voice. After 37 years in the booth, 37 years in the booth, Terry is about to retire. On behalf of members past and present, I want to thank Terry for his professionalism and dedication to bringing the proceedings of this House to the public for so many years. Thousands of listeners across the country have relied on Terry's explanation about what is happening in the chamber as we go about our business. Terry, your voice and your calm manner will be greatly missed. I'm sure that all members will join me in thanking you for your services and wishing you well in your retirement. Yeah. The Leader of the House, I have several questions to me, but if you would like to do this first. For the information of honourable members, I present a schedule of outstanding government responses to the reports of House representatives and joint committee incorporating reports tabled and details of government responses made in the period between the 28th of November 2012, the date of the last of the schedules, and the 26th June 2013. Copies of the schedules are being made available to honourable members and it will be incorporated into Hansard. The Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circa to honourable members earlier today. I made the House take note of documents numbered 1, 3 and 7. Full details of documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. The question is that the documents be noted. The member for Cowper. I move the debate be adjourned. The member for Perth has the call. The member for Perth on indulgence. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, for the sake of the record, the 2 plus 2 I forgot was Indonesia, so I advise that. Uh, Madam Speaker, 
Speaker, earlier... Order! The member for Perth has been given the call on indulgence. Earlier today I had a discussion with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister was gracious enough to indicate to me that he would like me to continue to serve in the Cabinet as Minister for Defence. Uh, I enthusiastically accepted that but advised the Prime Minister that I'm not proposing to recontest the seat of Perth at the forthcoming election. Uh, I have advised the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, the National Secretary of the Australian Labor Party and the State Secretary of the Australian Labor Party accordingly before question time. Uh, this, Madam Speaker, is in the nature of an indulgence and valedictory, uh, but I will do my best to keep it closer to an indulgence than a valedictory. I have had the great honour of being the member for Perth since 1993, and can I firstly thank the people of Perth for continuing to place their confidence and trust in me. Uh, if you were to ask me, Stephen, what is the single central reason why uh, you are not proposing to recontest, 20 years is a long time for any member of parliament, six years is a long time on the executive. But this may be something that only Western Australians can understand. Uh, but this is something that I cannot, in all good conscience, say to the people of Perth that I can continue to do, win, lose or draw at the next election, for another three years. Twenty years I can do, twenty-three years I can't. <laughs> so uh, I have uh, uh, made that decision. I've been thinking about this matter for some considerable time, but other events have not allowed me to have the clarity of thought which I've had in the last uh, couple of days, as other members have. Can I thank uh, the House for uh, the way in which they have dealt with me over the years, uh, sometimes harshly, most times benevolently? Um, can I also uh, say that I'm very grateful to two Prime Ministers, Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Gillard, for the opportunity that they have given me to uh, serve uh, in the Cabinet on, in, in the national, and on the National Security Committee uh, of the government both as Foreign Minister and as Defence Minister. Uh, for a long period of time, too long, I was a Shadow Minister, but my last portfolio was as Shadow Minister for Education in 2006-2007, and I was expecting to be the Minister for Education. I think I'm probably the only Minister for Foreign Affairs who, for the first three days, was disappointed he wasn't Minister for Education. <laughs> but I came to become accustomed with that. Uh, and when uh, uh, I... Uh, was asked uh, which other portfolio I might like to serve in. I chose defence because it kept me in the national security uh, arena, something I had not, frankly, focused on as uh, an opposition shadow spokesperson. And so I've had the good fortune of being involved in protecting and securing and maintaining the national security interests of the Commonwealth for nearly six years. Um, I don't want to give the lengthy list. But I think we've done some good things in those, uh, in those times. Uh, the work that we did to encourage the United States to join the East Asia Summit, uh, the work we've done to encourage India to uh, enhance its relationship with Australia, the work we've done with Africa to enhance both our strategic and economic uh, relationships, uh, and, in, and as uh, Minister for Defence, uh, despite some critiques to the contrary, I'm very pleased with the strategic elegance uh, of uh, the 2013 White Paper, and can I say uh, I am very proud of what I have sought to do together with the leadership of the Defence Force uh, with, in regard to defence culture and treatment of women. Um, I, uh, come to, I came to this place uh, uh, following upon uh, some long years as a, a Labor Party supporter and activist. I joined the party in 1975. Uh, I became the Principal Private Secretary to the Attorney-General of Western Australia uh, in 1983. Uh, he, of course, was Joe Berenson, one of my predecessors as the member for Perth. Uh, I then uh, became State Secretary of the Western Australian branch of the Labor Party. I became State Secretary because I had to wait for my good mate, Rick Charlesworth, known as Grumpy, to two of his mates, the only two he has. Uh, <laughs> I had to, I had, he's heard that before. Uh, I had to wait for Rick to decide that he wanted to do other things before I could uh, seek to become the member for Perth. So I became the State Secretary, uh, which uh, was a very good training ground, I think, for uh, serious public and political activity. Uh, Paul Keating then asked me to come and serve firstly on his staff, firstly as Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister. Uh, and Paul is a one-off. And so that collective experience came to me as uh, the member for Perth when I was elected in 1993. Uh, Rick Charlesworth uh, handed the seat over to me in good order and he was my campaign director. 
Uh, I let the local Liberal Party know in Perth that I will be the campaign director for the re-election of the Labor Party in Perth. You should fear that more than you fear me as a candidate. <laughs> uh, can, I, can, I, can I thank uh, some of my colleagues? I, 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 it's not possible to mention all of the people who you want to uh, thank, but in a long period in the parliament, particularly when regrettably sort of two-thirds, one-third is opposition rather than government, there are a lot of issues you go through where relationships are forged through fire, uh, and I just want to mention a couple, uh, not necessarily in any order. Uh, I am great mates with Albo, uh, and I said to him uh, the other day, Albo, if you become Deputy Prime Minister, I'll be able to call you both leader and deputy at the same time and be right, because for six years I've been Albo's deputy as Deputy Leader of the House. Uh, but uh, we've known each other for a long time, he from the left, I from the right, uh, but we are mainstream Labor and it's been one of the great joys of my life to be not just a colleague of Elbow's but a close personal friend and to work with him. I, have, I think he has been a hero of the Labor movement as Leader of the House in this parliament. Um, Jenny Mack. I sit next to Jenny Mack uh, in the ERC. Uh, and I always follow, have followed with Jenny, my mother's adage that there's always someone worse off than you and your job in life is to give someone a helping hand. I have never let her down when it comes to an ERC submission about those people who do need a helping hand. I can't look at her, she'll make me cry, uh, but, uh, but uh, that relationship also forged through a long period in opposition. My mate Stephen Conroy uh, in the Senate, um, Conroy is misunderstood by many. He is the most... <laughs> Con... <laughs> Amanda for Perth as the goal. Conroy, Conroy is the bravest member of the parliament that I know. Uh, he has raw courage, raw integrity, raw decency, uh, and will not deviate from what he believes in principle because it might have adverse consequences for, for himself. Um, finally, in this round, there are others, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to the 17-minute uh, time if I'm not careful, uh, is, uh, is my great friend, the member for Lilly. Uh, we became state secretaries together. We came into this house together, we became ministers together, uh, and um, I always thought that uh, Wayne was the person, when we were both in opposition and government, who most understood uh, the need for a Labor Party and a Labor government to represent uh, people who were of low or middle incomes, who looked to the Labor Party and the trade union movement as the institutions in Australian society which had an obligation to look after them. No one, in my view, crystallised that understanding or that commitment better than Wayne. And I thought, uh, in the t course of our time in opposition, both as Family and Community Services Shadow and Shadow Treasurer, that he did more than any other Shadow Minister to put ourselves in the position to win when we did in 2007, in terms of his policy and political attack upon the Howard government and, uh, and his ministers. There are a number of other people who have come into this place in later years for whom I have the highest regard and warm affection, uh, and I'm proposing to volunteer my gratuitous private advice to them as they continue in the parliament uh, and, in, uh, and in senior positions in, uh, in the party. I will have the opportunity to, because I'm remaining as Defence Minister for a period, the opportunity to formally thank uh, those people I have worked with uh, in, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and in the Australian Defence Force and the Defence Organisation. But I've had the great privilege of representing our country overseas. I've always tried to do that in an appropriate and civilised and dignified manner. Uh, but I've always been impressed with the quality of the senior civil servants uh, and uniformed officials that we have in those two departments. And it's been a great honour uh, to, uh, to work uh, with, uh, with those. As Minister for Defence, uh, with two CDFs, Angus Houston and David Hurley, uh, I have, as uh, an individual defence minister, on my watch, uh, seen more deaths than, a, than an Australian Minister for Defence since Vietnam. Uh, and uh, it's at those moments when you look into the Chief's eyes and you see the integrity, the decency, the commitment of those two individuals. And 
Uh, they are both uh, Australians of whom we can be proud. I'll make other remarks about uh, the, the DFAT and defence officials that I have, uh, have worked with, uh, but I've had the opportunity of working closely with quality, first-class Australian public servants, uh, Michael Lestrange, uh, Dennis Richardson, both as defence and, uh, and uh, uh, DFAT, and also Julian Bird, who acted in defence, uh, together with uh, Ian Watt uh, and uh, Duncan Lewis. Can I say of Dennis Richardson, who, uh, when the, heat, the, cork, the Hawk Keating challenge was on, uh, he and I were the ones behind the scenes who ensured that life went on uh, in a civilised way for those people who weren't combatants. Dennis is one of the all-time great Australian uh, civil servants, uh, and, uh, and any and every Australian government is well served by his frank and fearless advice, which it is in the finest uh, and uh, truest traditions. Can I thank uh, the House, can I thank the clerks, the attendants uh, uh, and the cleaners? When I first turned up for my first day of work on a Monday morning when I was on uh, Paul's staff, I got in about sort of half past seven, quarter to eight, uh, and the cleaners were there and they said, oh no, darling, it's much too early for them. You know, you'll have to wait, go down to Aussies and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> but I've always been well treated by the cleaners in the early hours of the morning and the late hours of night as I uh, wander through having done, uh, having done paperwork. Uh, because, uh, in a sense, this is a, uh, uh, a retirement from the parliament come the electorate, can I focus on a couple of things uh, so far as uh, uh, federal Perth is concerned? Um, I won't mention all of my electorate staff, but members know how valuable uh, and essential they are to us. I just want to mention one. Anne Keane uh, has been on my staff for all of my time as uh, the member for Perth. She was also uh, on uh, Rick Charlesworth's staff for almost all of Rick's time as member for Perth. Rick had 10 years, I've, I've effectively had 20. Uh, having Rick for 10 years, it's probably the equivalent of having me for 20, but <laughs> I, I make this point. Um, I'm the longest serving federal member for Perth, but Anne is the person who since Federation has made the longest continuous contribution for federal labour in federal Perth. Uh, and she has been uh, a heroine, uh, and uh, uh, I've been uh, blessed for her loyalty and for the work that she has done for me. If I think of Jenny Macklin, I will dissemble. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me conclude by saying, when I came into this place back in 1993, uh, Jane uh, and Hugo were in the house, uh, and uh, Maddie was uh, on the way. Uh, Hugo is now 21. Maddie's now 19, or as I often say, because they're a pigeon pair, Hugo's 21 going on 19 and Maddie's 19 going on 21. Uh, and uh, Jane has been, has been uh, long-suffering. Um, public life of its very nature uh, as a participant is inherently selfish so far as our families are concerned. And so the burden uh, falls on the spouse and the children. In one sense, I've been blessed because my children have never known anything else, so for them it's standard fare. Uh, but for Jane, as it is for other spouses, from time to time it has had its moments. But uh, after 20 years, if it's a choice between spending three more years here to make it uh, 23, uh, or the next few years doing whatever comes along uh, in Perth, uh, which those people would know because of the people I've taken to it, Condoleezza Rice, uh, Hillary Clinton and a few others, uh, I very much uh, enjoy and love living in Perth and I'm looking very much forward to doing that uh, and continuing to help federal labour uh, in whatever capacity, not just in Perth but uh, in Western Australia generally. I thank the House. the Prime Minister on the indulgence. Thank you, Speaker. I think all members of this place would agree that what we have just heard has been uh, an elegant and humane conclusion for an extraordinary career, public career in the Australian Parliament. And uh, we're going to be poorer for your absence uh, as an institution and not just as an Australian Labor Party. Um, Smithy is one of the few folks uh, to have served uh, since the Second World War as both Defence and Foreign Minister. There aren't many of them. 
and it actually says something about the professionalism of uh, the minister uh, that they can extend themselves across these two critical institutions of state, which lie at the heart of our national security arrangements. What do you say about Smithy? <clears throat> He's um, disciplined, organised, methodical. <laughs> and the best joke in the cabinet, which I will now publicly reveal, oh, is that um, when you really want to get under his skin, you really want to get under his skin. Uh, he has this impeccably organised set of papers, which are uh, basically organised like this, and there is not a centimetre out of place. So when he goes up and goes out of the room to get a sandwich or a drink, or the thing you do is just twist it slightly. <laughs> and when he comes back, his entire visual universe is turned on its head. <laughs> True? True? That's right. So, Smithy, we love you for that uh, because you're even more only retentive than I am. So, <laughs> the um, the uh, other thing I'd say about uh, Smithy's career uh, is we know him to be disciplined, highly professional, unflappable. And after the good people of Australia voted us in in 2007, uh, and prior to that, um, we were having a discussion about portfolios. And uh, I said to him, uh, mate, uh, how about you lend yourself uh, to the foreign affairs portfolio? That is the first time I've seen a universally unflappable Stephen Smith look like a stunned mullet. Uh, it was the first occasion where you looked as if you didn't see it coming. Um, and can I say, having served Australia as a foreign minister, he has served Australia well. Uh, what he has just referred to with our critical relationships uh, in the region is absolutely true. Australia's diplomatic relationships in East, Southeast and South Asia are in their best state ever. And that is a consequence of the diplomacy of ministers like Stephen Smith, who has made a singular contribution. Let me give you one example. He referred to it briefly, but one of the major foreign policy achievements in the last several years has been the invitation from ASEAN for the United States to become a full member of the East Asian Summit and to persuade our dear American friends to accept that invitation once it had been extended. Talk about a double treat. Um, the person who did a large amount of the diplomatic lead work to make that happen was one Stephen Smith. It's important because it's the first time the United States is a full member in a regional institution with an open political, security and economic agenda. I commend also his role as Minister for Defence. He has made an extraordinary contribution. Around the world, when I run into foreign ministers and when I have run into others engaged in the international policy debate, he is a figure who is universally respected. He is calm, he is utterly professional and he honours his word. For the Labor Party, uh, as he outlined his career in the Labor Party going back to 1975, almost the Mesolithic period for um, some of us who have been in this, in this business of politics. That is an extraordinary long service to the party, the movement and the values which we on this side of the House serve. Um, he has been a Labor warrior first class, and the, and the party deserves, him, uh, deserves to extend to him a great vote of thanks. I would say finally to all members who come to this place from Western Australia. I think of uh, the member for Curtin, I think on our side of the House the member for Brand, the member for Fremantle and the senators. This is an extraordinary sentence which you all endure. I can only say that your commitment to the nation, whichever side of the political divide we fall on, is doubly great because you spend so much of your lives on that plane. And so, Smithy, I understand full well how much your family have finally put their foot down, and I wish you and your family all, all the best on behalf of the Australian government. The leader, the leader of the, oh, sorry, the, Leader of the House. Can I just say very briefly uh, to my, uh, my deputy uh, leader of the House uh, and uh, my extraordinarily lifelong friend and uh, comrade Stephen, um, you have shown uh, today what an adornment to the parliament you have been since the day you walked onto the floor of this chamber. You are a class act. And I wish you and Jane and all your family all the best for the future. The Leader of the Opposition on indulgence. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And on behalf of the coalition, uh, I extend our best wishes to the retiring member for Perth. And may I say, on behalf of the coalition, that the Labor Party has lost today uh, another 
significant son. It seems, Madam Speaker, that there is something of a changing of the guard taking place amongst members opposite, and I suspect that the Labor Party may be the poorer for it. Uh, as all of us know, in this particular place there are opponents and there are opponents. Uh, I can say that uh, the member for Perth has always been an honourable opponent. If he told you something, you knew it was true, and if you told him something, you knew he wouldn't misuse it. Uh, regrettably, that can't always be said uh, for people in this place. Madam Speaker, the heaviest thing this parliament does is commit our armed forces to combat, uh, and there has been much combat in the tenure of the member for Perth as Minister for Defence. And the hardest thing uh, for anyone to deal with is casualties. And as the member for Perth uh, has outlined to the House, he has had too many casualties to deal with. He has had too many bitter words, bitter experiences to break uh, to good people who didn't deserve it. Uh, it is a very heavy burden to bear. Uh, the member for Perth, as minister, has discharged his responsibilities with decency and humanity, uh, and we thank him for it. Madam Speaker, uh, this uh, parliament in which we serve uh, is a vocation. It's not a career. It's not a job. It is a vocation, and the member for Perth has been an adornment to it. The, the member for Scullin has the call. Uh, uh, speaker, this will be a bit of an anti-climax, but I should adjust my cuffs, straighten my tie. There's, Stephen, there's nothing I can do with my hair, but anyway. Um, I just want to raise this because I think that it is an important development in the way in which this place operates. So, by way of a question to you, Understanding Order 103, does the Speaker agree that the efforts of officers from the Department of the House of Representatives and the Department of Parliamentary Services, at short notice, which enabled members and senators to carry out their business last night unhindered, whilst at the same time allowing members of the press gallery to appropriately give public coverage to the historic events, was exemplary? Will the Speaker convey to both the to both departmental officials and to the executive of the gallery the gratitude of the House for the development of protocols to handle such events both cooperatively and to the satisfaction of the interests of all concerned. I certainly will and I will concur with the member for Scullin in my appreciation to all the departmental staff last night and the members for the press gallery in the way the situation yesterday was handled. There were some outbreaks earlier in the day, but when the new rules were reinforced, um, that was adhered to. And I do actually wish to thank everyone and for the member for Scullin to bring it to our attention. However, however, there have been some unwarranted instances in the last 24 hours. And when members of the parliament and their staff breach the rules that the members of the press are being asked to adhere to. That is a grave violation. And people taking photographs in any section of the building nowadays where we have said they are not without the permission of the individual will no longer be tolerated. This is a workplace for everybody, and people should remember and respect that. The member for North Sydney has the call on a personal explanation. I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member for North Sydney claim to be misrepresented? I do, Madam Speaker. Uh, in his, I think, valedictory speech or preliminary. Pretend, preliminary valedictory speech, the member for Fisher said, and I quote, I do recall that Mr Palmer mentioned to me at that time that about Easter last year, Mr Brough, accompanied by the member for North Sydney, came to see Mr Palmer to ask him to fund James Ashby's legal fees with respect to the litigation which people listening would be aware of. Madam Speaker, that is patently untrue. I have never met Mr Ashby. I uh, did not know of Mr Ashby. The matter was never raised in a cup of coffee that I had with Mr Palmer, which has been widely reported. Uh, the matter was never raised in relation 
to that entire affair. And I note that Mr Palmer's spokesman has just said, and I quote, Clive has denied this about a thousand times, and I'd ask that the member for Fisher uh, correct the record. The member for Murray has the call. Wish to make a personal explanation. Does the member for Murray claim to be misrepresented? Most grievously, Madam, De Madam Speaker. Uh, I was a member of the Tony Windsor chaired Murray Darling Basin inquiry. During question time, the Minister for the Environment said that we, as members of that committee, had in fact uh, been in total agreement with his actions since then and that the recommendations of that committee had been in fact fully taken up. Can I say that is not the case in particular in relation to a triple bottom line approach or in terms of a strategic um, water buyback recommendation which said that there shouldn't be a generic buyback of water at all because it destroys irrigated agriculture. So this is a most serious allegation for those of us who worked hard on that committee and we do ask the government to revisit the recommendations of that inquiry because it's a most significant inquiry for the future of agribusiness in the basin. Thank you, Member Murray. The, the minister has a uh just about to draw your attention. You can't argue a debate in such a point. So, so, now she'll bring the member to Could I just ask those members who are carrying on conversations, they might just do so outside of the chamber, like call the member for Jellybrand.